Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Tonight, our speaker will be our abbot, Les K. So I think everyone here knows Les. Um, Les has been practicing for over 50 years. How many years has it been now, Les? Uh, I can't do the math. Okay, a long time. Yeah. Longer than the rest of us. So it's, it's great to see you, Les, and um, we're looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. You know, after you've practiced for uh, a little bit and you stop to, to reflect on the practice, if you stop to take a, a careful look at the practice, you'll discover or you'll notice that our practice is based on a very radical view of the world and of the individual's place in the world. And this radical view says that the individual is not the most important thing. Something else, something other, some undefined something other is more important. And uh, this is quite radical according to the modern view of the world that people have these days. So our practice is about holding an attitude of reverence and an attitude of humility where uh, a, a concern for ourself is not the main focus. To some people, uh, that's kind of radical. The concern of our practice is not so narrow. Our concern is very wide and it is very inclusive and it is for all of life. And this is a very ancient uh, spiritual feeling. So we can say that our practice is based on understanding or having an attitude of something that I'll, I'll just call unrecognized virtue or unacknowledged merit. Or in other words, our, our practice is about doing things or doing something without caring if anybody notices. Or in other words, the attitude of our practice is to do things, to do something without hoping to be recognized or without seeking for some kind of recognition. Uh, and according to our practice, this attitude is the basis of our life's fundamental activity and the basis of spiritual practice. So the foundation of truly knowing how to work and how to do things means to be fully satisfied with doing inconspicuous work or what the world would call inconspicuous. So uh, part of our attitude means not to worry if the work that we do if the activities of our life are noticed or not. The attitude of our practice is we don't give that much attention. It means that when our daily attitude, our daily activities, when our daily activity is based on practice, our activities are done with a very wide worldview. 
In other words, beyond the immediate, the beyond the immediate moment. And this means to have a very long range vision of what it is we do with our life. So the value of this attitude is neither temporary nor permanent, and it, it is not short term or long term. Actually, you can't describe it. And there's no need to describe it. This attitude is beyond description and beyond distinctions. For most of us, I think that the work that we do in today's world uh, will be forgotten, won't be remembered. And uh, usually pretty soon. And usually while we are still alive, people won't remember what we've done. In fact, you quite often hear the term, what is, what is it that she does? So if, if it means that uh, the work we do is, uh, will be forgotten, if we really care about what it is we do, we have to make our effort for future generations. And we must find satisfaction in doing work that is quiet, that other people may not assign much value. If we can do that, if we are satisfied with this kind of quiet work, we will have a life of composure. But if we have a uh, short-sighted view of, of what it is we do, which is based on gaining attention or gaining fame, then we will lose our composure and our life will lose its value. So working without ego is how we hold our life together, how we make it complete and how we give it meaning. If you've spent time at Tassahara, you know that they wash dishes and scrub the floor with this view. In the, in, this, in the culture that we have, you know, if, uh, if we are smart and if we are capable, uh, we can do anything we like. And people and all of society will ask us to do things for them. And they will offer us very nice rewards for doing them. Sometimes these rewards are material, and sometimes these rewards, these rewards are given out in terms of approval and recognition. But if we do things in our life based only on pleasing others or only on what they want, and if we base our activities on being rewarded, we are allowing ourselves to be used by others. And in a way, we become their puppet and we are not being true to ourselves. So to be helpful in the world in its true sense, we have to be careful of continuing an attitude that where we devote ourselves to taking care of inconspicuous things, then we will have confidence in ourselves in a very large way. If we want to understand 
uh, the meaning of life in a spiritual way, we may turn to studying various religions. and remember the best points in them, the teachings that ins inspire us. And we can be guided by what we read about th these various practices. But at the same time, we have to be careful about being greedy, about trying to gain truth from outside from somebody else's belief system. You know, if in your practice or in your daily life, you have a faint or a subtle glimpse of the truth, that's enough. When it is your glimpse, and when you have it, you should devote yourself to it. This is how we can find out, this is how we can discover the true meaning of our life. And this is the vision of our practice. This is the vision, of, this is the vision of Mahayana Buddhism. In the Lotus Sutra, Buddha says to light up one corner. And you, everybody is familiar with this expression, to light up one corner and not to worry about lighting up the whole world, but just to make it bright where you are. And in Suzuki Roshi's book, To Shine One Corner of the World, he says, if you share one corner, then people around you will feel better. You will always feel as if you are carrying an umbrella to protect them from the heat or rain. So th there is no need to be famous or to be widely admired or widely respected. And there's even no need to be of great use in a, a social sense. The most important thing for us is to be ourself. But if we fall into the trap of always striving to be admired or powerful or in control, we will lose the meaning. We will lose the meaning of our existence. So if we become proud of our practice, if we become proud of ourself, or proud of our reputation or what we have attained in the daily world. That means we are relying on something outside of ourself to show us meaning. But we cannot find the meaning of our life with that kind of orientation. It's uh, because we rely on others for recognition or to be rewarded. When we rely on others, we become very proud of ourselves. But when we are truly independent, we do not re rely on anything outside of ourself. And we will not carry with us the burden of pride.
So when we don't understand the meaning of making an effort just for its own sake, obtaining approval from someone else doesn't mean very much. So our practice often talks about finding our independence and our confidence. And when we have our independence and our confidence, it means we are not deluding ourselves, but to see ourselves exactly as we are. And this is not difficult if we are sincere with ourself. If we are aware of our practice and aware when it gets away from us. And when we realize we have to pick it back up and come back to ourself. Our, our, our practice cannot be perfect, but when we are aware of our imperfection, then our practice is really working. So people may not notice or acknowledge what we do from day to day, and they may not say thank you, but it doesn't matter, does it? On the other hand, we should always say thank you when somebody does something helpful. So even if you do accomplish great things in this world that are of great benefit to people, and people express their gratitude, don't forget to shine your light in the smallest corner where you are. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Les. So if you have a question, you can come to Gasho and unmute yourself or I can unmute you. I see Janet. That was a lovely talk. I miss you very much. Thank you. <laughs> When are you coming back? I don't know. Oh. How, how many times have you heard that question? Yeah, I know. When are the restaurants opening? Oh. <laughs> then I'll come back. Uh, no, I have to um, stop in a motel on the way back. Oh. And I want to make sure that's possible. I mean, it's mm. all weird, isn't it? Yeah. It's all weird. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Ah, you made me cry. Les, yes. Uh, would you mind giving us an update on your health? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to do that. <clears throat> uh, I'm cured. <laughs> okay. I'm Good. cured. 
but uh, I'm just uh, taking some follow-on treatments to um, for maintenance to ensure that everything is is all clean. But fundamentally, I'm cured. Ah, and my and my life is normal. Wonderful news. Wonderful news. That's wonderful. That's great. I have a question. Yes, Doug. I less. So if I recall um, from uh, understanding your sort of uh, professional and then Buddhist career, I think you were working full time at IBM um, yeah. until you retired and started becoming our abbot uh, full time. And I've been doing that for, you know, you can't even count how many years now. So I'm interesting interested in hearing about the conversation you had with yourself and maybe Mary and other folks on uh, where you knew that the most impact you could have in terms of shining your light wasn't, you know, with IBM and the Silicon Valley company and all those things. With, you know, there's a lot of tools there, but rather working with Canon and, uh, and, and why you, you think that that was the best decision for you and how you sort of thought through that. Uh, well, I, I uh, after I got into the practice, uh, I continued to work full time for several years. I didn't. I did not work full time um, for Conan Doe. It was part time. Uh, I uh, shared my time between uh, Conan Doe and the family and work, uh, but I never went through uh, the thought process like you described. You know what's the trade-off, and what's the best way to best place to put my energy, and I never did that. I uh, I think my mind was saying, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm getting involved in something new that feels very very right. Uh, how do I get involved with it in a meaningful way, without dropping out? or sacrificing my other responsibilities. Um, so I just let it evolve. Uh, I never made the, uh, well, until uh, when I finally did retire from work, then I knew that I could devote most of my time uh, to the practice, to Conan Doe. But for a number of years, uh, I just let it percolate and, did what I did based on feelings rather than some rational decision. Is, is that the back of your head I see behind you in that black thing? Oh yeah. So now when you, yeah. When you, yeah, it's the back of your head. Okay, so I see the the front of your head and the back of your head. <laughs> Great. Jayashree. Hey, Les. Oops, I guess I guess I'm hey, Jay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Les. That was so helpful. Always need that reminder to do things without ego. Um, I, what I found was so helpful, you know, how you sa said that when, when you do something, don't expect the thank you. And I, I think I try to do that, not to wait for that verbal thank you, but I find that it's so difficult because even though you tell yourself, okay, you're doing this, you don't need for the person to thank you. You still kind of look for some other subtler cues, like maybe a glance, you know, maybe they'll acknowledge. And it, it's so, your mind plays such, you know, you, you, you tell yourself, I, I don't need that thank you, but your mind still plays those games with you that you look up and say, well, did, the, did, did he like, like what I did or did she like what I did? Do you know what I'm saying? It's so, it's very difficult, very difficult to do, to get your mind to stop that. So I don't know if you have any, <laughs> how do you get, 
get your mind not to do that. <laughs> I'll keep working on it. Yeah. Keep your keep up your practice, and little by little, uh, you'll let go of it. Thank you. I have a quick comment related on that um, because I, I can relate to Jayashri quite a lot, um, especially with work situations. Like when I feel like doing the right thing, not only sometimes is a thankless job, but sometimes you get thrown under the bus for doing the right thing. You know, um, sometimes it's very thankless and it's hard. I think sometimes I really wish it would turn out differently, but this was a good reminder for me because thinking about your talk tonight, Les, it's like being myself is its own reward, you know, like, so what if I'm not acknowledged for doing the right thing? It's, I got to be myself, you know, and that feels really good. So thank you. Um. Well, I have a small story. Uh, the other day, uh, I, I met with someone out in uh, a garden. And uh, when I came back in the house, I noticed that there was a caterpillar on my sleeve. You know, he caterpillar found the, my sweater because we were in the garden. So uh, I went outside holding my arm up and we I got to some uh, leafy place and I gently push the caterpillar onto a leaf. And you know, that feels good. And nobody's around to say, good for you. <laughs> it feels good to take care of things like that and to take care of other beings like that. And that's where our satisfaction comes from and that's where we find meaning. Um, and it often means being close to nature, but it takes place also when we're just close to each other. And that's, that's the basis of our practice, Taking, taking care of the small thing that you suddenly notice you need to take care of. Janet? Giuseppe, how are you? Oh. Hi, Giuseppe. Tell us. I need to unmute him. Hang on. There we go. Go ahead, Giuseppe. Hello. Oh. Uh, hello. Hello, Giuseppe. Bonnie, thank you for organizing everything. Les, thank you so much for the beautiful talk that speaks to me uh, very directly. And Janet, hello, so nice to see you. Um, I want to say that um, the subject of your talk is really close to me um, every day. Um, and I wanna share that um, my, my work situation is that um, I am the, the, the head of the company that I founded. So I'm the CEO of the company that I founded. And, and that's an interesting um, viewpoint um, because you would think that that um, gives you independence. Um, you can express yourself also in the work life. But actually, the reality is that it's no different from any other job. Um, and you are just in the same way, um, the same pressures from 
that everybody else in the job that could lead um, you to behave like a puppet. So I think um, it's, uh, you know, the same. It changes the puppeteer maybe, but in every um, uh, world life or um, setup, you always find the same um, uh, situation that if you are um, looking, if you don't have this uh, internal independence um, based not on, on the uh, results or, or, or being acknowledged by others, um, I think uh, you always, uh, you're always a puppet. So, it's um, um, it, I just wanted to comment on that, share that, my, 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 my viewpoint on that. Uh, at the same time, also, I think uh, um, it takes um, uh, really our practice um, helps us very slowly to uh, um, let go of this attachment we have to these uh, um, rewards, the, these rewards. Um, a little bit like the sugar craving or other more immediate craving. Um, also the craving for, for um, this um, um, reward from others, which in, in the end, then makes in other moments feel us miserable. Then sometimes people feel miserable, and we feel miserable, or I feel miserable, because then I feel that things are not, I'm not recognized or things are not going the way I want. So it's really um, very well thought out approach to life, the one that Buddhism the Buddha is, uh, is proposing us, I think, um, where he gives us this hope of finding a stability uh, and still being engaged in what we do. So thank you for, for uh, uh, speaking to that so clearly. Um, and also, giving us the room here to take our time to get there. <laughs> Teresa, uh, oh, hi. Hi, thank you for your talk. What is the ego good for? What, why do we have it? Hmm. We do have to make decisions in our life every day, every moment. We have to decide about uh, which action to prefer over another one or what we have to do to fix a problem or uh, to gain something. Uh, we have to have a mind that thinks like that, that solves problems and, 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 and to fulfill its need to be creative. Uh, so the ego is part of that. Or part, that is part of the ego. So the ego isn't all bad. It does provide progress and it does provide creativity and it can provide us with some kind of self-confidence in our everyday life. Uh, it's just that I think Buddhism warns against going too far with ego, not to become proud of it. But because we're human beings, uh, it's, we need it. It's part of us. It is us. We can't deny it. So uh, we should enjoy our ego, 
but uh, treat it kindly and don't, uh, mm, you know, enjoy it like you might enjoy a very modest ice cream. It's good, but don't, not too many scoops. Thank you. Columbine. I think I muted oh, myself. Sorry about that. Pardon me? Um, no, I, I, think, I think I was talking and I re didn't realize that I was muted. So go ahead. Okay, Columbine and then Diane after. Okay, um, I think to Teresa's point about um, not necessarily the need for ego, but one thing that occurs to me um, about um, appreciation, especially when it comes to, say, your parents or, say, um, in work situations, um, I think that there is a fear instinct with work if you're not, um, if you don't think that people understand that you're um, performing well, especially in the Silicon Valley, you can be fired or laid off. Um, so it comes down to, um, I think that um, getting appreciated is something that we seek um, from our colleagues, but it also comes down to a kind of instinctual um, need to feel that um, we're safe. You know, we're going to get a paycheck and we're going to be able to pay for groceries and stuff like that. Um, and with our parents, I think we seek approval um, because I think that's something that we're, um, even from the time that we're babies, we're just sort of taught that that is what we're supposed to do. Like we do good things, they are happy. We do bad things, they are not happy. It's very um, ingrained in us, I think. I think when we're very, very, very young, uh, we need to be given rewards to teach us what are the right things to do, what are the constructive and kind things to do. As a child, we, we, haven't, we don't know how to make those judgments, so uh, our parents reward us for doing things, for doing activities that they want to encourage, much, much like you might train your dog you're trying to teach your dog to sit, and when she does it, you give him a treat, and the dog learns how to sit. Uh, but as we grow older, we learn from our own experience what's the right thing to do. We, don't, we no longer need treats from our parents to teach us. We learn from our own experience and from just paying attention what's the constructive and creative and uh, the most helpful things to do. So actually, we, we need to train ourselves and not depend on somebody else to train us. Umar? Hang on, let me make sure you're unmuted. If I can find you. There you are. So I just wanted to ask, uh, is should the, even after doing our practice and getting off our cushion and going out into the real world, um, our attitude should not be any different than it is on our cushion. Is that correct? 
Yes, that's right. Okay. Thank you. So there is no separation between, um, so there should be no separation between our practice and our real life. Right, they're not, not two separate worlds. Okay. Vanessa? Hi, lads. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Um, you talked about uh, finding or, or sort of recognizing truths within ourselves, smaller truths that come, and having confidence in those truths within ourselves. And it's something that I, that element of confidence is something that I often struggle with. Um, because I, um, I have a fear of arrogance and I, I often wonder and, I, and I'm afraid of confidence spilling into arrogance and, and where the border between the two might be. Mm. Um, so I wonder about kind of guarding against that. How do we stop confidence from becoming arrogant? I think uh, true confidence comes from being able to acknowledge to ourself that we are doing the right thing, that we are trying to do the right thing, that we are continually trying to do the right thing, trying to find the right way. When we can say that to ourselves, you know, if we can always say, you know, I'm making my best effort, and then we can find confidence in that. That's a bit different from the confidence that says, oh, uh, I can do this, or, uh, um, uh, I can make three pointers or I can slam dunk or uh, it's a different kind of conf confidence. It's not a confidence of accomplishment. It's a, a confidence of selflessness. You know, I think when we, when as individuals, when we accept the notion of selflessness, and we make our best effort to live it, there's confidence there. Making that effort to be selfless is where confidence comes from. But if we say, oh, look at me, I'm becoming selfless, then we start to lose it. <laughs> So if you can feel that you're always making your best effort, you won't have any problem with arrogance. Oh, hi, Brenda. Hi. <laughs> I don't know what, one of the things that I think about with confidence and arrogance is, um, what's the response that you get from the other person? What's the answer, right? Like they, you know, are they, do they, uh, are they, does it, does it cause the other person to grow and, and kind of, do they look happier? Do they look more um, fulfilled? Do they, do they shine? And when your attitude is one of arrogance, you see the other person kind of shrink down and like, ah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they don't want to hear it, right? 
it, it seems to be a very, very, you know, people sense that, right? Like you can, you can sense it in other people. It's very intrinsic in us. Yeah, it, it, it's not even arrogance. Uh, it's mostly indifference. It's a, it's a, a subtle attitude in sometimes in, sometimes a subtle attitude in people that tells them, oh, I don't have to say thank you. Oh, I don't have to acknowledge that. They don't need it. I'm not going to do it. That's sort of indifferent. It doesn't give recognition to the other, pe the other person's trying to keep a good connection. So if you say, well, I don't need to, I don't need to uh, thank her for that. Yeah, then of course that could escalate into arrogance where they say, oh, 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 oh the heck with her. <laughs> but mostly it's indifference. And that can become very pervasive. So, you know, part of our practice is to avoid being indifferent. To show that we really care for each other and to acknowledge each other and not to turn away. But if somebody turns away, don't take it seriously. Don't take it personally. Maybe they have something on their mind. <laughs> I, have, I have a question. How, how do you not take it seriously? <clears throat> how to how not to how not to how not to yeah oh i don't think there's an instruction manual on how to or how not to you have to discover it You know, related to what Brenda is saying, uh, Les, you always say that one of the most important things in our practice is relationship, right? The relationships we have with each other. But how do you keep relationships going if when you face indifference? So because relationship has to be both ways, right? So how much effort do you make? Endless. Endless. E e even if uh, uh, the other person becomes difficult in a situation. Uh, don't become indifferent to them. Just we have to continue with we have to continue living according to our own understanding of how we should live. Can I ask one more question? Um, just wanted to ask if um, any of um, this has to do with empathy, having empathy for the other person, even though the other person is really difficult with us. What, what, about, what about the empathy? What, 
that um, when even when we don't get along with certain people, we can have empathy for uh, other people, correct? Yeah. Yeah, if we find ourselves in a difficult relationship, uh, rather than get, rather than separate or push away or get annoyed, we consider that the other person is having a hard time. Okay. And so they're either indifferent or arrogant, um, and it's not our fault. We don't take it personally. They're having a hard time. Okay. So we continue to acknowledge them and not be indifferent. Okay. Thank you. Giuseppe? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, hang on. Okay, go ahead. Les, can yeah. you, can you um, give us a little bit of a hint on um, how to um, practice this uh, selfless effort? Um, also in our practice, um, it's the thing that I find uh, the most difficult, uh, the more tricky. It's like they say, move and you're trapped. You know, if you try to um, put more effort in your practice, um, you might tend to do it with your ego, which is your norm more normal way of putting efforts into things um, and and that uh, is not helpful so it's I think I find the most difficult for myself to learn to try to teach myself how to apply this uh, selfless effort for instance in sitting I try to sit every day at the same hour without even thinking about it, rather than um, focusing on, on um, increasing or changing my practice. Um, but how expanding that ability to do the selfless effort is, I, I find it tricky every day. So what did, can, what advice can you give on the art of making a more selfless effort? Hmm. When, when we first start to practice, uh, that's the usual attitude. Oh, I must make an effort, or I must sit more hours, or I, I must achieve something. But with experience, if you continue with your practice, your attitude changes to one that says, oh, this is the right thing to do. Everybody should do this. I will do this because this is the right thing to do. This is the way I express myself. And then your practice becomes more relaxed and you simply follow the schedule. Whatever schedule you've set for yourself or whatever schedule you may be involved in with other people, I'll just follow the schedule. That's all. Now what's next? What do I do next? In my life, what do I do next? Hmm. Like I said in the beginning, this is a radical view. It's not about 
you know, gaining something or saying, how much more effort do I need to make to get where I want to be? It's just that we're already there. We're already where we need to be. We just need to express ourselves in the most natural, most simplest way. So when you get up in the morning, you just go to the zendo or your, your cushion. And when it's time to get up and go have breakfast, you just do that without thinking. Just go do it. That's all. And don't, don't be concerned too much with making any progress about letting go. If you just follow the schedule, it means you've let go. Janet, was that a question or are you just saying hi or thank you? Yeah. What was that? About Giuseppe. Oh, you were thankful for the question. Got it. Thank you. Any last questions or comments? Well, thank you for your talk, Les. It's really good to hear you again and hear your Dharma talk. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. All right, I do have a couple announcements. Um, one is that this <coughs> Saturday, this coming Saturday, we will have a board meeting, a Sangha meeting, and everyone is welcome to attend. So it's going to be at 8.30 a.m. So we used to have it at 10.30, but uh, it's going to be at 8.30 a.m. this Saturday, which means that we will not have our final sitting at 9.30. We're going to be having the meeting instead. Um, otherwise, the schedule is the same. And if you have any questions, feel free to hang on at the end, and um, we can talk about the Sangha meetings. Um, so next week, let's see. Next week, who is our speaker? Brenda? So I think it's Brenda. Yeah. Brenda, do you have a, a planned talk or is it going to be a surprise for us? Uh, surprise. It's going to be. Okay, great. <laughs> um, and then I think at Canando, and you know, most of you have seen that we have some gardening tools out. People are welcome to go practice there or garden. Um, and help take care of the place. Please let us know if you know you notice anything off or something we need to have a look at. Um, and those little tiny basil plants out in front of the back house, like uh, where the back house is, I think on the porch there, there's a bunch of little basil plants and Dixie cups that you can take home and plant. That it was a gift from our friend Sandy and our Sangha. And I don't think I have any other announcements. Uh, Dave, looks like Dave has an announcement. Uh, not an announcement, just a question. Uh -huh. uh, just wanted to uh, make sure that the uh, same Zoom link works month after month for the Sangha meeting. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. The Zoom link for the Sangha meeting is the same link that we're using for Saturday. So the Saturday program, since it's on Saturday, you can just use that same link. And it's uh, all of the links are recurring. So. And okay. Good. By the way, uh, another little Zoom tidbit that uh, I think maybe some people aren't familiar with because this whole microphone muting thing keeps coming up. Uh, when you're in Zoom, the space bar is a push to talk button. If you hold it down, it unmutes you, and when you let go, you're muted again. Oh, interesting. I didn't even know that. Hang on. I got to test this. It's, I think, I don't know if it's working for me. Anyway. Maybe it, maybe it works when you're on mute. Okay, but yeah, thank if you. If you're you like hold it down and speak while you're on mute, and then pull. Ah, okay. Push to talk. 
let me see if it's working now. That's amazing. Thanks for that tidbit, Dave. That's really cool. So we can just stay on mute if we want during the discussion and then you can hold down the space bar to talk and then remove it. If you want to, if it's too much tech for you, don't worry, I'll take care of it. But that's it's great to have the option. Thank you, Dave. So Bonnie, where did you say those plants are? They're in front of the back house. So you know how, like if you go in the courtyard, that entrance to the back house, they should be right there on the porch. So I was there today. There I, didn't, any? I didn't see any plants there today. It could be that they all got taken home. Either that or someone moved them to the back porch. But I had thought that there were a lot. There were like 80 plants. So. Oh, no. I, I don't know where they are, but I opened all the doors and looked around. So I, maybe she took them or somebody took them. Okay. Well, I'd be surprised if all 80 were gone already, but you never know. They're on the bench in the courtyard. Oh, they're on the bench in the courtyard now. Okay. Maybe they were getting more sun. No, they're at, they actually get more shade. Oh, more shade. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll check. I'll, I'll check next time I'm there to see how they're doing. Thank you for that update. Um, one quick reminder is that all of these Wednesday night discussions are recorded. So uh, we want to respect everyone's privacy. The recording will be shared on YouTube, so video and audio, but if you want your question removed or you know you don't feel comfortable being on the recording, please let me know right after this meeting. You can send me a chat message, you can send me an email, that way I can remove your question before we post, um, post the recording. Okay. All right, any other last announcements before we close out? Okay, and we will close with the four vows.